the Tribe album is, of course, dope. I mean, it's different levels of dope. There's certain Tribe albums that are doper than others, and then there's certain ones that are, okay, well, like, Low End Theory is the high point for me. It's one of the greatest albums of all time. The the new album, what's the full title? The, the, uh, we Got It From Here, Thank You For Your Service. We Got It From Here, Thank You For... This is a long title. We Got It From Here, Thank You For Your Service is... Dope, but I say that with the caveat that I've only listened to the whole album once and I loved it, but I also and I like this that I hated it as well because it pushed me. And I think great art is supposed to push you, great hip hop is supposed to push you. When you listen to Young Thug, you say, Oh, that song listens sounds just like that other song that he did, which sounds just like that other song, and it's not pushing you. Right. Tribe stuff sounds different. This is different than their previous experiences, and that's at first kind of offensive to somebody who likes tr classic tribe stuff. And so I, I love it, but I hate it. But I'm, I, I tend to actually buy a hard copy because I'm a product of the hard copy generation. And so when I get that hard copy, I'm actually going to just listen to that hard copy and put it on repeat, press the button on repeat. And it's, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing that I'm going to love it. I'm guessing that it's going to go on my pantheon of, of amazing albums that, you know, I listen to over and over. And as far as it being a response to um, Donald Trump or, or just the vitriol and hate that we hear right now, the, the, the atmosphere that we see around us, Tribe's music is always good for that because it's always about love. It's always about trying to find love and something beautiful in a, in a bad situation, you know, and that's. That's what um, I, I don't expect anything less from that. And the sentimentality around it um, regarding, you know, Fife Dog um, not being God bless Fife Dog, you know, his family. Um, that was a big loss. 2016. We have big losses this year. Um, we have, you know, uh, David Bowie, Maurice White, Muhammad Ali. I mean, we, we have Prince. Uh -huh. Prince. Prince. We have uh, Leonard Cohen. Leonard Cohen, that's a big one, man. I was a Watchmen fan, that, that, that movie. And they had that song, Hallelujah. And I was, oh, man, this song is amazing. And, you know, we lost big, big giants this year. And um, I think it's only right that something creative and positive and constructive came out of that. And that's the Tribe album. And I'm so thankful for that to put some, a little bit of balm on those wounds that we have from 2016. And then, well, obviously, one, another big wound is Trump. <laughs> and so that's a big wound. Yeah, we're losing Obama. Right, we're losing Obama, we're losing Michelle, and you know, they're, God bless them. I hope they have a beautiful private life, and I'm sure they will continue to contribute, but, but it's a big transition, and it's been a traumatic year. You know, like Tupac said, last year was a hard one, but life goes on, and you know, this album hopefully is gonna help us go on and, and make some sense of it. <laughs> I don't expect Trump to honor anything because he's not an honorable man. And, and he says that. I mean, the first thing he does, literally the day after the campaign ends, the election ends, and I'm cool with this stuff because, good, he, you know, he's trying to figure out one of his big promises. Within the first 100 days, I'm going to repeal Obamacare. Then he says, well, you know, Obamacare is kind of cool. <laughs> like he's trying to find ways to get out of his campaign promises, right? Well, maybe we're not going to build this wall between us and Mexico. Uh, maybe we're not going to, to deport 11 million folks out of this country. And so you see he's not an honorable dude in either direction, whether for good or bad. But, um, yeah, you know, for Native people, um, it's twofold. Yes, we have absolutely been in the news more, and that's good. I mean, and sometimes through very, very, you know, in a, a terrible means. So, you know, Indians were in the, in the, in the uh, pop culture because the Cleveland Indians were in the World Series, right? The worst depiction possible of a Native person. But also the Native people, the powerful Native people who are out there striving, not just for our own water, but very importantly, our own water. And to say our lives, our water, our babies, our future is worth just as much as yours. And that's a powerful sentiment. But also the, the, the benefit, the ripple effect that comes as a result of that, you know, literally millions and millions of people are going to benefit from those Native people who are out there protecting that water and protecting our future generations. So Native people absolutely have been in the um, news and pop culture more in 2016, and I think that is absolutely a good thing. Here's the thing. This is going to be the test. Whether or not we remain in the pop culture, not just to be in pop culture, because who cares about that? You know, celebrities fleeting, we don't care about that. But 
it's important to, to see if any of the philosophies, the worldview that these people who are protecting the water permeates past this just this one incident. Okay, it's sort of like there's a meme I seen, and it's a beautiful meme. I don't really think refer to memes as beautiful, but but this meme is beautiful because it's deep. And it said, "If only people love black people as much as they love black culture." Right. And yeah, that's true because you know, like you might like black music, you might like hip hop, you might like Jay Z, you might like yeah the, the gear, you might like you know Rachel Dolezal, you might like you know what's the, what's the girl's name, the uh, Kim Kardashians. Uh, sister, uh, Ky Ky Kylie, yeah, uh, uh, Kylie, Kylie, Jenner. Kylie Jenner, yeah, like her, you know, wearing the weave and stuff like that, right? But but I'm not gonna get involved when you know there's some police harassment going on, when when you know Black Lives Matter, somebody got shot specifically because of the color of their skin, and they have a different outcome than that white person would have had. They're not gonna get involved in that conversation, and so. This test with, with Dakota Access Pipeline specifically, but it's bigger than that even. As big as that is, as monumental and as historic as that is, it's even bigger than that. And the question is, are people going to acquire some of the worldview that is promoting these Native people to be out there protecting our water sources? That is that people always choose pain in the future instead of pain now all right, well, we want this money right now and we'll pay for it later on. And what these Native people are saying is the exact opposite of that. They're saying, you know what? We don't want this short money that you've offered us because there was money that was offered to this Native community in exchange for their acquiescence. And that happens all over the United States. They said, we don't want that short money. We'll take that short-term suffering or impoverishment in exchange for in perpetuity for future generations to be able to drink clean water, to know that their ancestors stood up for them, to know that they were worth fighting for. And that's completely opposite worldviews. So hopefully with Christmas season coming up, people will decide, hey, maybe it's okay to have a little short-term pain in exchange for long-term gain for the betterment of our word, world the betterment of our children, the betterment of future generations, the earth, that we're going to actually, you know, like maybe we don't need that other car. Maybe I don't need that Escalade. Maybe I don't, I don't, I don't need that big old truck that's going to increase carbon emissions. Maybe it's okay not to have this, this, this bottle of water. They say that every single year, the, the, uh, if you stretched out the bottles of water around the world, it, it could stretch out all the way around the world. And so maybe I don't need that and just put a little bit more conscious thought because that's what Dakota Access Pipeline is about. Like, this is conscious thought. This is people saying that I'm willing to suffer just a little bit because that's what they're doing. Now. They're out there suffering. They're out there sacrificing for all of us, getting pepper spray, getting beaten, dogs sicked on them. And they're willing to do that for the few. I was there. I didn't get pepper sprayed. I didn't get based. I was out there out of convenience. And I have to say that very respectfully because those folks have a different type of sacrifice than I've had. It's a completely different type of sacrifice. And what I'm saying is that hopefully the worldview permeates where we say, OK, they're suffering like this. They're sacrificing like this. We can sacrifice just a little bit to try to change the world. Donald Trump's election. You know, you and I talked about this. It's interesting from a storytelling perspective. I don't know if it should have been at such a surprise like it was. Um, you weren't surprised. I was surprised. I, I, I can't lie. I was surprised. But in what world is a heterosexual white man, billionaire who has had multi-generational access to money, to, to media? I mean, he makes media just walking outside the hotel. In what world is that guy an underdog? And so I, I don't, it, it, it shouldn't be such a surprise, but it was, and it was traumatic. And, and some of the factors that went in there was, well, first and foremost was just America being America. <laughs> that, that America was very America that day. We're going to vote for the white, heterosexual, billionaire guy who has multi-generational access to media and, and money. Um, but more, I guess, broadly, I definitely, obviously, race was a big factor. 
it was an issue. It was a factor. It was a consideration. The post-Obama effect, I think, was significant. Backlash, Backlash yes. Um, the, the, the misogyny, sexism, absolutely. Definitely factors. I, they're probably, I, I remember I thought, I thought that Obama's race would be a larger fact. Like, because so, sometimes it was interesting. 2012, I, 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 Mitt Romney ran for office. He's Mormon. A lot of people have confusion or are mistaken ideas or something. I don't know a whole lot about the Mormon religion, but I think a lot of people have stuff that they naturally assume about the Mormon religion. And I was like 2012, I was doing the analysis. What is more significant in the polls? The fact that Obama's black or that this guy's a Mormon. And I was trying to do sort of a, a backwards looking analysis regarding this election. I, What's going to be a bigger factor? The fact that Hillary's a woman or that Obama was black? Like, which one is going to be a bigger factor? And it seems, based upon the numbers, that Hillary being a woman is a bigger factor. Now, we don't want to do the oppression Olympics. We don't want to say one thing is more harmful or more toxic than the other because all of them are toxic. We don't want any of that mess. But we have to say that the numbers show... <laughs> that people are really, really tripping on a woman. And a lot of those people who are tripping on a woman are women. 53% of white women voted for Hillary Clinton. That's crazy. Or for Trump, Trump, excuse me. Yeah, voted for Donald Trump. I thought it was going to be women turned out overwhelmingly for, for Hillary Clinton. And I don't mean that in any sort of way that that's the only analysis. Obviously, she's qualified. She has a lot of job credentials. But... All things being equal, I figured they would give the tie to Hillary Clinton. Just in the same way, if all things are being equal, I'm giving the tie to Obama. He's black. I'm voting for him. And it wasn't that complicated. But, no, that's not what it said. So, obviously, sexism, misogyny, race. But I think there was another thing, too. And this is something that I, I don't think people talk about a whole bunch. That I think that there was, there's just a divide within our country. So let me explain. Two weeks ago, I was in um, South Bend, Indiana, at Notre Dame University. And I, Notre Dame is beautiful. It's pristine, beautiful stuff, like structures and stuff like that. You go to the other side of town, and it's, it's, it's hood. And it's, it's like, you know, it's like you could tell the economy is depressed there. Right. Why? Rust Belt, steel mill town. You go up the road a little bit, Gary, Indiana, where where Michael Jackson's from, and they used to have 300,000 people in that town. Now they have less than 80,000 people. A lot of them work for city government. A lot of them work for state government. That's where the jobs are coming from. It's a welfare state. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way. I mean that in a way that everybody's dependent upon the government. Those regions have been hit. Those rural regions, midtown America, have been hit so hard by the destruction of the manufacturing economy what not what trump was talking about nafta right. nafta was a lot of that stuff and so they were hit so hard that it makes sense to me irrespective of color that high percentage uh relatively speaking of latinos who voted for trump that if you're somebody who's affected by this the destruction of the manufacturing economy it makes sense to me that you might think well yeah we want to repeal nafta i'm not sure if that's possible i'm not sure if there's any benefit that economy has gone i think but it makes sense that you have some sort of reaction to somebody who was a supporter of that economy right. hillary clinton Bill Clinton. It makes sense. And so I think there was a very strong urban versus rural split. And urban people, I think, and I'm going to make a gross generalization here, but oftentimes we think that these places, these enclaves, these urban enclaves are the center of thought within the United States, that everybody thinks like us. And this election to me indicated even more so than those very, very strong things that we talked about, misogyny, sexism, racism, that were absolutely there. I think it was more, no, city people, you don't speak for all of us. Your opportunities, that you're able to go to your job, take public transportation, that doesn't speak for all of us. We're not all living like that. So I think that there was a very strong element of urban versus rural um, misunderstanding. And I also think to follow that up to the degree that we dismiss all supporters of Donald Trump 
as racists or sexists or misogynists or xenophobic, I think we missed the point. There's absolutely those people there. No question about it. But I, I think a lot of them were genuinely motivated by a real interest to improve their own lot in life from that American dream that they feel passed them by when those manufacturing jobs left. So that's what that's what I think the factors motivating Donald Trump's election were. It doesn't surprise me. The fact that Donald that, that Kanye West said had the that Kanye West said that he would vote, he would have voted for Donald Trump if he had actually had the inclination to vote because he's just Kanye West and he just does weird stuff. And, you know, I think there's, and I also, and I mean this in sincerity, I think there's other issues there. I think Kanye West has other issues that um, his, his handlers do a very good job of disguising. And, and I, I mean that honestly, and also with all due empathy, because it's not a laughing matter. But I think he has other issues there, and I don't necessarily think that he has a, a, a filter that will allow him, the, an internal monologue, like Austin Powers said, that will allow him to, um, to understand that some of the things he says are just delusional. And, and I, once again, I'm not making light of that. I'm being serious. I'm, I'm talking in a clinical sense. I think Kanye West has some stuff going on. So it's no surprise to me that he said that he would um, have voted for Donald Trump. Unfortunately, this is the sad part about it, is that the reason why he would vote would have voted for Donald Trump would not be for the reasons that all of those good folks in middle America voted for Donald Trump, where they were actually trying to make a referendum that that, you know, this economy doesn't help us. It doesn't speak for us, even though the Dow Jones is doing record numbers. We're not part of that. He's not doing it for that reason. He's doing it for Kanye West reasons, which is Kanye West and Donald Trump have a lot in common. They're both sensationalists. I think he had like a representation of Donald Trump in his video, right? Yeah, in his video. And they're both sensationalists. They both say stuff for effect instead of. So I'm guessing that this particular statement that he made, it probably wasn't even true. Because he, I don't think he actually looked at the merits of what Donald Trump represents, other than that he's a sensationalist. He's somebody that in the world of capitalism, in this world where, you know, filthy lucre, rule, you know, it, it rules everything, that Donald Trump is, is an alpha within that world. He's somebody that can actually make the decisions and do the things, execute the things that Don Kanye West wished he could do. So the whole conversation with Sway, for example, you don't have the answer, Sway! That, well, Donald Trump does have the answers in that he has the money to be able to access the worlds that Kanye West wants to access, right? And so it's not that he thinks that Donald Trump has any character, integrity, honesty, anything that's admirable for him, his family, his two beautiful children, but instead that simply he's somebody that in this dirty world of capitalism where it's doggy dog and the person that tells the best lies oftentimes is the person that get, makes the deals. He wants to be a champ within that world. And I think that's really unfortunate. It says a lot about Kanye West's level of integrity, about his level, what he values. And I think that we found for the man who made Jesus Walks and for the man who who made some really, really beautiful songs at one time, All Falls Down, like, you know, that that spoke about materialism and the dangers of materialism and excess. Um, man, you come a long way, baby. Like you're, you're not that person anymore.